Thank you very much. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank uh, you for the invitation to speak. It came totally out of the blue because um, uh, I hadn't even heard of this organisation to my embarrassment. I'd also very much like to welcome our international speakers and to thank them for their contribution. Okay, so Dr Jude, uh, I uh, have a slightly different history to a lot of vets. I started out in the horse industry, I left school at 15, totally uneducated, um, eat chaff for breakfast type horse girl. And at 35 I went back to school and I had to do biology and chemistry and try and get into vet. Well, I had a tutor three nights a week. I didn't know what I was getting into, thank God, because if I'd known, I probably wouldn't have done it. Having said that, I graduated at 41, and I don't mind admitting that I'm 50, and I'm self-employed, and I realised today, after listening to John, that I run a community vet service, <laughs> <laughs> and that I give out a lot of credit, and I treat a lot of animals for free, and I do a whole bunch of stuff I don't get paid for. And uh, that is probably the essence of what we're going to talk about today. I'm also a very proud AMRIC member, and there are many AMRIC members here today. Jules. And uh, there's a little bit of the history here that I now no longer need to explain because Emma and Alison have done such a great job. I'm proud to say that Alison's group up there in the Northern Territory are part of a shire that has successfully desexed over 2,000 dogs in the last two years. That's an achievement. So cat days, why cats? Cats, I think, are one of the most underrepresented groups in animal welfare. And this little cat, her name is Emma. Emma is in Egypt. And uh, she shows a lot of the features of what a desexing program in uh, those types of countries is about. So uh, my name, my telephone number, my email, it's all there. Why? Because I actually run my entire business through a mobile phone and I answer it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So join the club and you can ring me. Oh, pointed at the screen and it moves. Isn't that lovely? Okay, so little Mr Cat here is in Egypt sitting in the rubbish in Cairo. Um, I call them discount cat desexing programs. They are not free. Okay, they are not free. However, the program that I ran in Egypt is uh, a free program. So our Australian programs and our Egyptian programs, I thought would make a nice little contrast for you to hear about today. He's not an untypical Egyptian cat, he's got one eye. Well, that represents all our cats in the photos, even Emma in the first photo. You couldn't see her other eye, but it's completely clouded over. And that's your classic herpes and all the sorts of diseases that cats have. And uh, here's your big male tomcat sitting amongst the rubbish, doing pretty well in Egypt. You've got 20 million people throwing their rubbish out at the moment, no rubbish collection. And uh, I was there in March this year, and I must say I was very glad to get on the plane and get out. The tension was palpable. I was there for two weeks. Uh, I think we did about 48 surgeries. Uh, that was a shock to the Egyptians because over there they'd never had more than one or two surgeries done in a day. The day we did 14 cats it just about killed them all because uh, they were so exhausted trying to keep up with me. So how it started was I went to an island in Arnhem Land during the week of the intervention. So I was actually there right when it all changed. I saw the dogs living off the nappies in the street, I saw the starving puppies, I had the dogs carried out to me by the front leg to be put down by people saying, just kill it. And I've been back every year ever since, and I've seen it change and improve, and it has, thanks to AMRIC and the work of a lot of good people, and the shires that have picked up the banner and gone on with the desexing rather than the culling. So I wrote a report and I sent it everywhere, and I mean everywhere. The Prime Minister got one, the main Minister for this got one, everybody else got one. AMRIC found me. Ted Donnellan gave me a call and he said, don't you think your report was slightly hysterical? I said, no, Ted, it just wasn't hysterical enough. So obviously what I saw upset me and it still upsets me, but when something upsets you enough, you should do something about it. I can, therefore I should. So 
I've uh, taken that concept and I've expanded it to Egypt with a group called Prince Fluffy Kareem. Disregard the name. Fluffy is to get people into fluffiness, pinkness, you know, fluffy nose bands. It's better than a chain. Chain with fluffy nose band is better than chain without fluffy nose band. Um, Prince, just simply because, you know, they had to give the horse a name, so they called him Prince Fluffy Kareem. He was the first horse they rescued. It's all over the internet. If you'd like to have a look, it's well worth it. So we've heard all about Amrick, but I'm going to tell you about each picture as we see it. I work in skirts because I'm a lady who lives in jeans and steel toe cap boots and braces. And the reason I wear skirts is because in those particular communities, the ladies wear skirts and it's more culturally appropriate. Also, it's very, very comfortable, it's humid, it's warm, and also the dogs prefer it and it's much easier to catch them with a skirt. So my dog catching equipment consists of a sheet and a big skirt. They wash really quick, they dry really quick, you get peed on, no problem, wash it, spay a dog, put it back on, job's right. Okay, this dog, like many of the dogs that Alison spoke about, you go back year after year trying to catch them. This particular dog, um, he was, uh, had a broken foot, he was big and scared and frightened, and my policy is catch and carry. Once I've got hold of them, I don't let them go because I'm confident handling them, I'm okay, I don't expect someone else to do it. A lot of people in Indigenous communities are actually very frightened of dogs, and with good reason. That's their experience, the dogs can be dangerous, so if dogs can be difficult, dirty and dangerous, what are cats going to be like? Well, cats can be fearful, flighty, furious. And I know this much, when a cat says to you, I am going to get you, it means it. And I come from a horse background where you put your hand up and the horse says, yes, boss, no problem. So when I had to work with Cats, I had to learn a lot about cat behaviour in a hurry. And I now know, and have the scars to prove it, that cats aren't kidding. So what I've done is taken my horse knowledge, brought my energy down, slowed my heart rate, controlled my breathing, put my eyes somewhere other than the cat's face, and I have slowly learned to work with cats. Also got a really good pre-med that's reversible. They wake up really quick. So the dog on the right of the screen, big black dog being held by um, the local policeman at the back in Jude's famous patented dog hold, um, had already bitten me on the ear. So the golden rule is when you got them in the dog hold, never ever let them have one foot up. That's the foot they push up with and then they bite you as they go by. The dog at my feet is Princess. Princess is everybody's pet dog on the island. She is much loved. Um, she's there just giving moral support. She's not trying to attack me. However, pick up and catch and carry a dog in a community. Expect that you may have up to 20 dogs trying to attack you if that dog starts to cry or anything like that. So you've really got to be able to do this efficiently without setting up, upsetting I should say, what's going on with the local dogs around you. The other little dog in my arms in the cage is called Troll. Troll was heavily pregnant. I picked her up, she was as fat as a fool, she'd been living underneath the quarters of the people who were working in the island. And so every time the Troll heard people walking up and down the stairs, the Troll came out to get fed. So Troll's pregnant, fat as a fool, and I carted her around the back of the car. We went and spoke to everybody until we found the owner and he refused permission for me to de-sex her. Now, I will de-sex everything, including the dog that is giving birth, the cat that is giving birth, everything, because there is nothing crueler than to leave an unwanted puppy in these communities. I've counted the puppies at one trip and come back and counted how many survive. So. If those puppies were wanted, no worries. I left that bitch in, intact and in good condition and I came back six months later and she'd starved to death. So, whoops, that's why I do it. That's why you do it. Every one of those dogs is an individual. Every one of them means something to me. Puppy's good, got wormed, 
got D6, got a home. Okay, you got to mobilise the clinic, you got to take a nurse. You might not always take a nurse, but if you can take a nurse, it really helps because nurses are great at rounding up dogs. Nurses are great, great at getting things done. They're great at rounding up that oxygen bottle that was supposed to be there. They're great at calming me down. Really good to travel with a nurse. Really good to take a volunteer. And ironically, the vet in the photograph to my right is Alison's husband, Dr Bill, on his first volunteer program up there with me. So where are we working? Like Emma showed in her talk, in the machinery shed, I'm working on whatever the heck we can get up to the right height, not two 44s in the door this time, I'm on paint tins and a machinery table. Um, natural light, that's usually all you've got, headlight if you've got one, and uh, as the next photo shows, you make use of absolutely everything that you've got. So the toilet is our um, pre-medication area, and okay, so Cats are not a priority for animal health dollars. Cats are viewed as a feral species. They're breeding at exponential rates. They're devastating in the environment. We've already said that when it comes to these programs, that the money comes from relating animal health to human health. It is not about animal welfare. We don't go up there viewed as if we're going up there to do animal welfare. We're going up there to do community work by aiding the animals, which aids the community. However, it is not encouraged or officially more or less illegal to have a cat in Arnhem Land. And these are little islands out in the middle of nowhere where the environment's very fragile. So I personally have put an emphasis on de-sexing the cats on those islands. And that means that I know where every cat lives, who owns it, how many were there last time. And I'm also very aware of the rate of population growth. Um, now, you get hold of a cat in Arnhem Land. Keeping hold of that cat is a problem because it's not like a dog. You can't just carry it around in your arms. We don't have cat cages and carriers. Two, um, what do you call them? Those uh, Male sacs, thank you, Julia. Male sacs are absolutely fantastic. You can also pre-med through the male sac. Okay. And lots of people get a shock when they see me dart straight through the towel, the sheet or whatever and into the dog. But... Not being able to see what is attacking you is always good. Um, the other thing is milk crates, that's what I was trying to say, and electrician's ties. A couple of milk crates together, electrician's ties, that works good. Um, broken uh, boxes, all sorts of things that we've used. These cats in this photo are pre-medded, and hence the relaxed attitude. But what would happen is you'd put them in the toilet, and you'd shut all the louvers, and you'd hear crash, bang, <laughs> Make sure you shut the toilet lid, <laughs> right? Because as the pre-med kicks in and the cat becomes slightly almost comatose, don't want cat falling in toilet. So these cats are almost unconscious and this is my waiting area for cats. And I do uh, de-sex cats up there as well, although I was often frowned upon for having done it. So why is it so hard everywhere you go to get a cat to de-sex? I've put cost at the top of the list. It's all about cost, and I'm going to come back to that. Other issues are trapping. I've got people, that, even in my local area, who want me to de-sex the cat, but they cannot catch it. And believe it or not, they cannot trap it. And I've spoken to another AMRIC vet, Steve Cutter, about this. And I said, why not, Steve? He said, because basically, if it isn't alive and fluttering, if you're a feral cat, you're not interested. They're not going to come in for whiskers. They're not come in, coming in for the fake birdie. They want the real birdie. So trapping cats, catching cats is an issue. Another is the concept that if you feed it, you own it. A lot of people, even down where I come from, still struggle with the idea that the cat that walked in off the street is actually their cat because they've been feeding it for three months. It's not their cat. It's just, it's just the cat that came in. You feed it, you own it own it. Microchips and registration. Well, I'm going to argue de-sexing is more important because microchips and registration are one of the things that people say, I can't afford to do this, this and this. And if I ring you, are you like the police? And are you going to dob me in because my cat isn't registered <laughs> or it hasn't got a microchip? And I say, hey, I'm not the flaming council. 
I don't care. Get it to me and I will de-sex it. So by offering discount microchipping, and there are communities such as um, the Barclay Shire, which actually run a program, a de-sexing program for the community where the de-sexing of every animal is free. I've just come back from Tennant Creek 10 days ago and we've done 115 uh, animals up there and it was all funded by the Shire. However, you then had to pay $30 to get your dog registered and if you could afford 60, you could register it for life and the microchip was free. So rate of reproduction, once people get a few cats or they've got you know, a pair of cats, next thing you know they've got 30 cats because they still thought they'd save up or that four month old kitten wouldn't get pregnant or whatever and the next thing you know they've got a whole bunch of cats and then the cost, it all just becomes too hard. Another thing that Emma touched on was culture. In Egypt, it's viewed as unnecessary. It's unnatural interference. It's painful. You wouldn't want it done to you, so why would you do it to an animal? And for a lot of people in a lot of cultures and in a lot of remote areas, this is something that they struggle to get their head around. And even in normal I would say middle class society, a lot of people still think like that. You only have to ask the bloke about why his dog still got its balls, okay? So difficulties in running a local de-sexing program, a discount de-sexing program. Um, John touched on the legislation and the legal aspects of what is involved. Other vets sabotaging the program. Okay, well this was a significant factor for me. I had a particular vet in another town who approached the vet surgeons board who are then obligated to investigate any complaint that they receive. Now they automatically come down on the side of if it was you the client, they're there to protect your interest. They're not necessarily there to protect my interest. So I had to go in several years ago and defend my position. So I rang up and I spoke to the veterinary registrar and she was very kind and um, she said well actually I'm going to your area next week. I said yes you're coming up for a meeting with all the other vets. I'll be there that night. She said well actually since I'm in town would you mind out if I came out the next day and visited your program? So the next thing I know I'm actually de-sexing cats in front of the veterinary registrar. But you know what the proof of the pudding is in the eating. I'd done the job, she saw the program, she saw the hall, she saw where we were working. I'd already addressed all the issues in writing, spent nights up late having to write these uh, you know, reports to uh, answer the questions that they'd asked me and I thought everything was fine. Guess what, two years later the same vet did the same thing, put it in writing again, different registrar, start all over again. And this time I said, you know, look, am I going to have to go through this every single time somebody doesn't want me to run a discount de-sexing program? They said no. They said, you know, there is now a precedent for this. We have um, mobile vans going around with one of the welfare agencies in Melbourne and you're not going to have to go through this every time someone has something bad to say. But I also have vets out there in my local area who tell people that we're not qualified, that we don't give appropriate uh, service, that we don't provide aftercare, that we don't give uh, the right drugs, that I'm not even a qualified vet, and the list goes on and on and on. Um, the other thing is the costs are being carried by the vet, which is me. Uh, it does need to make a profit. I can't do this forever without making a profit, but I don't take a wage. So how I choose to spend my time is my problem, but I still have to pay staff and it still has to break even. And we have to have virtually zero complication rate in surgery and aftercare. Now, I don't have to go 100 miles away to run a discount program. I only have to go 15 kilometres from my local clinic and people will drive from 45 kilometres away past my clinic to where the hall is that we rented for 50 bucks because it's cheaper. So I know it comes down to price. Oops. Okay, so what does a day involve? Well, we've got to get a venue and we've got to choose a date. Not Mother's Day, not Father's Day. Tried that, they don't work. Okay, not school holidays, not footy grand finals, 
there's a million things you can't do. The other thing, we always used to do it on a Sunday, but now I've started doing them on Saturdays just so that my staff can have a day off. Um, but the reason we always do them on weekends is because you get all the cats that people can't get to the vet during the week. Venue. The venue's got to be suitable. That means it's got to have a hard floor, it's got to have a sink, it's got to have good lighting, it's got to be clean. We need to organise advertising. I don't do the advertising, lucky for me. Um, a local group, a Chuka Animal Rescue Service, they advertise them, they organise them, and all I do is answer the phone and take the bookings. And then we have the confirmation process where we ring the client back, we confirm the booking, we make sure they get the directions right. There's a lot in that. And then we have to have a discharge, we have an admission protocol, but we also must have a very good discharge protocol where we talk through the aftercare individually with everybody and there is mountains of paperwork, no matter how much you simplify it. Veterinary science involves a lot of paperwork. Okay. So every cat must come in a cage. Now this is a compulsory requirement. It doesn't always happen, but wherever possible the cat comes in its own cage. It stays in its cage for the day. If they bring a cat that isn't in a cage, that's okay. We'll provide them with a cage for the day and we'll keep that cat in the cage all the way to the car and only let the cat out of the cage in the car for it to go home. But from the second it gets there, it's got to be in a cage. When it leaves, it's got to be in a cage. It stays in its own cage and there's no cross-contamination um, between the cages for the cats. So we've got to have a protocol. We've got to have a process for everything. So obviously you've learned today that for vets, height of operating table is very important. Emma likes rubbish bins and a door. I happen to have my four steps and then I have piles of newspaper under those and it could be Besser bricks or whatever it takes to get the table up to the right height. We bring all the equipment, oxygen, uh, app alert, anaesthetic machine. We've got all the usual things. It's a scrub. I wear gloves. We have antibiotics, pain relief uh, and it's a full, full anaesthetic. And Mandy in the photo there has four cats that she's lined up in the pre-med section and each cat's cage has all its paperwork on top of it and that means that it's microchip form if it's getting microchipped, it's vaccination card if it's getting vaccinated, it's discharge form and it's sterilisation certificate which is a half A4, one piece, one, one bit of information is on one side and the discharge is on the other to keep it simple. So we work at doing 20 cats a day. Doesn't sound like a lot of cats. The most I've done in a day is 30 cats or 30 something cats. We were there till seven o'clock at night. If you allow about 30 minutes per cat spay, some are gonna go a little bit less, some are gonna go a little bit more. At the end of the day, if I've done 10 boys and 10 girls, I've had a pretty decent day's work and I've got other calls and other clients and other issues because it's Saturday and so horses always go through fences and get colic on Saturday, Friday night. And I've probably been up till God knows what hour. So we started out doing male cats at $30 per cat. We've got it now up to $45 per cat. In my everyday clinic, it is $68 per cat. And that would make us the cheapest clinic around. Doesn't make us the cheapest in Victoria by a long shot, but it certainly is in our area. and. Our goal is to bring in the cats that wouldn't otherwise see the vet. So again, vaccination, it's our standard uh, collective price. So if we were doing a litter of puppies, we would charge $30 per puppy or kitten. So we charge it like a collective price. We're making a little bit on each vaccination, $30. A microchip is 35 and that goes with lifetime registration into central animal records. So, Previous photo, obviously, we were doing a castration hand ties. I don't glove for the castrations, but I do scrub and sterilise. Ovario hysterectomy, or sometimes called a spay, is $90. I do a midline procedure. I'm pretty happy with doing a midline procedure. It could also be done by flank spay, but all of my cats are within driving distance for aftercare. If I had to go and provide aftercare to a cat, it, I can do it. So. Cats carry a set of unique issues for anaesthesia and recovery. That's me in Egypt. 
and that's in my more horsey kind of mode. And we've got this little cat that's chucking up breakfast, so pointed downhill and into the rubbish bin. And the smallest cat that I've ever spayed is probably about that big. Um, and uh, they have a very small airway. They have a, a thing where they get laryngeal paralysis when you're trying to uh, pass an ET tube. So you have to use local anaesthetic down their throat. You often need a little wire in the tube to stiffen it to get it down. There's nothing simple about spaying a cat. And even though we're doing it in large numbers in world record time, and uh, you know, we've got a protocol that we follow, it's, it's not simple. Paul is a retired human anaesthetist and he's volunteered and come out on a lot of um, the desexing days with us and we run anything from 5 to 15 a year, it just depends. Uh, he is sitting there genuinely watching every cat recover. And the most important thing about anaesthesia is that every animal that is in recovery is being observed because it doesn't usually go wrong at induction, it doesn't go wrong later in the piece, it usually goes wrong at recovery. So we've got a discharge and aftercare protocol. Mandy in that photo is explaining to these ladies all about uh, what they need to do and what they need to look for. And they're getting their sterilisation certificate which they can use for the council that has a microchip. Saturday or Sunday, is it worth it? You've got five working days, you need 100 cats, 50 female cats, four and a half, 50 male, two and a half. At the end of the day, it's a hell of a lot of work to turn over less than 10 grand before costs. So here we are in Egypt. Now the interesting thing about Egypt is that they don't have inhale and anaesthesia, even for people. The gentleman to the right of the photo, Ashraf, is a biological science graduate. He was the surgeon. Not There was no vet at that particular shelter. They need visual signs that the cat is de-sexed and this is also done in some programs here in Australia. You might think it's cruel, but I tell you what, from a distance, when you know how hard it is to catch a feral cat, you want to know whether or not you need to waste time on that cat. So the ear cropping tells you whether it's male or female and whether or not it is de-sexed. And we introduced the idea to them of tattooing. So Egypt doesn't have a cat problem. It has an absolute cat plague. And the future for me holds more animal health programs in horses, cats and dogs. I hope to promote the cat day concept and I include cats in all of my AMRIC work. And thank you very much. <laughs>